Hi, we're here for another episode of Tidbits of Preservation. Our guest today is Leslie Reed, who's the CEO of Madison Park Development Corporation. And we were lucky enough with the Preservation Alliance to have Leslie join our board of directors last year. Leslie, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So we're looking forward to talking to you today. So I guess the first logical question, just to kind of get ourselves warmed up and get things started, is how are your residents faring through this crazy situation? You know, it's... um. A really challenging situation. I think we're particularly aware that a lot of the residents of affordable housing, especially in communities like Roxbury, are being um, hit particularly hard by the negative impacts of the virus. And at the same time, um, we've been really inspired by um, how so many organizations, city agencies, and public agencies have rallied um, in support of our residents, um, delivering you know, food supplies and PPE and um, doing wellness checks with seniors. Um, we never knew the strength of collaboration and partnership until this particular moment. So while it's um, challenging and scary, um, there are moments of inspiration that have come out of it. Well, briefly tell us about, about Madison Park Development Corporation and your role and maybe, you know, briefly, uh, I know it has a long, interesting history, but, you know, a little mm -hmm. summary. So Madison Park Development Corporation um, is a nonprofit housing and community development corporation. We'll be celebrating our 55th birthday next year. The founders of the organization founded the Lower Roxbury Community Corporation as a nonprofit to take title to land and develop it um, as mixed income housing. Um, and then subsequently um, got designated as a community development corporation, which is the nonprofit affordable housing developer, community-based housing developer that is kind of, you know, become more familiar. Um, there are probably a dozen in Boston now. The founders really were pioneers. And um, instead of having somebody develop, have the city have somebody else develop the housing, they got together with um, planners and advisors, consultants and architects that worked directly for them. In the past 50, 55 years, um, we've developed over 1,300 units of mixed income housing, a couple hundred home ownership units, and have implemented an array of community building programs, among other kind of health equity and youth development programming. Let's shift a bit and talk a little bit about the interface between historic preservation and affordable housing. As you know, there's, there's a lot of people think there's an inherent conflict there. And, you know, we asked you to join our board because we agree that that isn't the case. There's a lot of synergy. So can you talk a little bit about your perspective on that? I really enjoy um, the aspect of affordable housing and community development that involves saving and restoring and reusing existing buildings. Um, I just find that interesting. It's challenging from a design and construction perspective. The economics can be different and more interesting as well. So, um, you know, inherent in affordable housing, especially in a community-based setting, is um, you know, again, saving existing buildings, saving the residents that live there, or catching a building and turning it into a use that benefits the community in some way. And so I see, you know, kind of an inherent connection there. The preservation community has been a great advocate in securing resources, um, mostly tax credits from the um, federal and state government, to support the preservation of buildings generally. But that resource, when combined with affordable housing and other community development resources, becomes we can really leverage it. And it really helps us, again, to save and restore buildings, but also ensure that they're affordable permanently. Um, to some of the most vulnerable um, families in our communities. Uh, you may know that we're actively, the, on a national level, the preservation mm -hmm. community is working on enhancing the uh, federal historic credit even more, so hopefully there'll be more opportunity. One thing you said um, makes me think of another question. You think that a, a resident in a historic building gains some benefit or a different experience than they would in, in ground up construction. I wouldn't say better or worse, I would say different. And one example that I'll use is that a pretty familiar model is the adaptive reuse of historic school buildings into affordable housing. And there's probably a dozen examples across the city of Boston and beyond. It's kind of a, a standard thing. And, 
you know, those buildings are so gorgeous. And in a new construction, you know, stick built project, you're not going to have an apartment with 10 foot ceilings and arched windows and gracious hallways, you know, it adds to the continuum of, of housing opportunities that folks can have in the community. You know, Madison Park has two properties in its portfolio that are adapted um, school buildings. So why do you think they're, I think among the general population anyway, um, certainly not within people in our field, and I think a lot in your field, but certainly among the general population, there's this presumption that affordable housing and historic preservation are in conflict. Why do you think that's the case? Well, you know, I, I think perception is everything. And I think sometimes people's perception or experience of um, historic preservation might be trying to preserve what we call, we call the revolutionary history, for example, of Boston, seeking to preserve that. So, you know, as the city is changing and its people are changing and, you know, a lot of residents of affordable housing represent waves of change in the city of Boston, immigrants, people of color, you know, um, you know, low income working class people, I think there's a perception that historic preservation is about preserving the, the historic, uh, the like revolutionary history of the city. And that can kind of feel, people can feel excluded from that or that it's somehow obstructionist. Yeah, yeah, I know. I understand. You know, that's certainly something, as you know, and we're glad you joined the board, you know, to hopefully help us continue to spread the message that, you know, we're talking about everyone's history. You know, I look forward to continuing to work with you and the housing community. We've worked very collaboratively on getting the Community Preservation Act passed in Boston. Uh, we're very closely with affordable housing folks. But, you know, is there anything you can think of that we as a preservation community and as the Preservation Alliance could be doing better, should be doing better to, to strengthen those synergies and, and let more people know that we do work better, work well together? Having a better presence in the neighborhood and acknowledging the histories of the neighborhood would be great. Um, you know, what are the different um, aspects of different neighborhoods that warrant historic preservation? I think a lot of community members actually are historians themselves. They just don't view themselves that way. And I'll use myself as an example where I didn't know I was a historic preservationist, you know, until I got to... Um, do some historic preservation and restoration of some buildings as affordable housing. And so I think there's a lot of members, especially of the Roxbury and neighborhood communities that are historians and as well. So I think taking that kind of um, educational interactive um, um, programming into the neighborhood is a great way um, to build relationships, um, connections like through the Community Preservation Act, and that's a way to start to make a connection beyond kind of the downtown history. And we say it all the time that it's not just saving old buildings to look at them because they're pretty, right? It's about how do you find a new use for them for people, uh, and what better new use for people than, than housing. Um, one sort of final question I have is since joining the board, is there anything that, that you've taken from it that's been a bit surprising or that you've been able to apply to your work or um, anything stand out is, is yeah. something that you've really gained from joining our board? Yeah. Uh, I'd share two things. One is I was really pleased to find out how many of the board members actually had deep roots and experience um, in the Roxbury community. You know, historic preservationists, I, I, I think it's in your heart and your soul, and it's not downtown. And so it was nice to meet people who, um, you know, who understood my community. The second thing is, I think there's an interesting dialogue around um, sustainability and resiliency and preservation that, um, you know, but for being at the Alliance, making that connection, that as we think about how to move towards sustainability and also resiliency, that continuing to reuse and adapt existing buildings is really, really important for our future. And so I, f I found that very interesting, and I'm not sure I would have necessarily made that connection. Great, great. Well, I'm hoping that the, the sort of bi-directional learning continues. Uh, that's what good board members are all about, that uh, they grow and we grow collectively together as an organization and as individuals. So thank you for being willing to, you know, donate your time and energy to the Alliance and to bring your expertise to us. And uh, thank you for your time today. Really appreciate it. I know everyone's super busy and juggling extra many balls these days. So uh, I thank you for your time and, and wish you well. Great. Thank you.